Welcome back to our series of videos on domes. This particular video will address the various possible shapes for domes. The funicular shape is the shape required to avoid bending stress and assure pure axial stress in the material in the dome, preferably pure axial compression. The funicular shape for a dome is different from the funicular shape for an arch because the load distribution on a dome is different from the load distribution on an arch. However, as a frame of reference, it is helpful to revisit arch shape as a prelude to examining dome shape. We have already demonstrated both analytically and experimentally that the appropriate shape for an arch subject to uniform load as distributed along the horizontal or projected along the horizontal is a parabola. As shown in the broad gate exchange house in the image here, for which the arch weight is less than 2% of the load that they are carrying. And that load is 10 stories of concrete slab, floor beams, and live loads, all distributed uniformly along the horizontal. <clears throat> to first order, we ignore the self-weight of the arch and focus on the other loads, which are uniform as projected on the horizontal. This image shows a high parabolic arch of about the proportions of the Brogdead Exchange House. So that is this inner curve here, which we are also drawing in the context of a catenary in a semicircle just for reference. This image shows a shallower parabolic arch also with a catenary. And in this case, an arc of a circle and an ellipse for reference. If this structure was made out of concrete and was very heavy compared to any snow load that might accumulate on it, then the primary load would be the self-weight of the structure, which is uniform along the curved form. By definition, the funicular form for this arch would be the shape that would result in pure axial force in the arch with no bending moment to induce bending stresses. Finding the funicular form for this particular structure under this load is very easily accomplished using experimental modeling techniques. This tensile structure fits the criterion that its self-weight is uniform along the chain. Furthermore, by the nature of the chain, it can only resist axial tension along its length. It cannot resist any bending stresses. Therefore, it can only assume one shape, which is the funicular shape. In the case of this structure, that funicular shape is a catenary. This chain can be suspended and allowed to assume its natural shape, which is a, in a state of pure tension. Then it can be turned upside down very, very carefully, and it will have the perfect form to support its self-weight in pure compression, as shown in this image. The load on this arch is uniform along the length of the arch, but not uniform as projected along the horizontal. In the center, we've drawn two lines centered on pins that are one link apart. So you'll notice those two pins right there. And the total is one link. When we copy those two lines without changing the spacing and move that to one end of the arch, we get this situation right here. The two lines are intersecting pins that are two links apart. So here we have one pin, there's the same pin in the next uh, link, and the same pin in the link after that. So they're basically two links apart. In other words, the load is projected on the horizontal is twice as high near the supports as at the center of the arch because in this given horizontal dimension, there's only one link up above, but in this horizontal dimension, there's actually two links. 
Since there is more load on the catenary near the supports than at the center of the arch, the catenary tends to be a bit fuller at that part of the arch than is the parabola, which is the appropriate funicular form for a load that is distributed uniformly along the horizontal. The catenary has to bulge outward, so this is the parabola, which is appropriate to the uniform load. This is the catenary, which is a bit fuller or bulges more uh, near the quarter points. Um, as a way of responding to the higher load that exists on that part of the structure. So it's bulging outward here, but becoming flatter at the top in response to the variable nature of that load. As we demonstrated previously, deviating significantly for the, from the funicular shape for arches can induce severe bending stresses in the curved structural member. Here we have a high parabola and a low parabola, an arc of a circle, a semicircle, and an ellipse. Here we have all of those uh, curved elements fully loaded with a uniform load of one kip per foot along the horizontal. In this diagram, we show the actual axial compression stress. In this case, it's fairly light because we have a really deep arch and it's structurally very efficient. Here, the forces are larger, but also quite uniform. So this is a pretty reasonable configuration. Um, you'll notice that all of these things are fairly predictable in terms of compression stress. What's really shocking is that we, when we look at bending stress, we have essentially no bending stress in either of these parabolas. We have bending stress in the arc of a circle, which is beginning to be comparable to the compression stress. And then in the case of the semicircle and the ellipse, we get these enormous bending stresses which really dwarf the compression or axial stresses. Um, what we're saying is these members are acting more like rigid frames and they're resisting forces through their moment action more than they are through uh, axial action. So we'd be more appropriate to call these rigid frames than to call them arches. So the uh, funicular shape is really important. In the case of arches, the parabola is working really well. The arc of the circle is working decently. And then the semicircle and the ellipse have these enormous deflections and very high bending stresses. We have methods of holding an arc of a circle or, or in this case, a semicircle in its shape to resist the compressive force without inducing excessive bending stresses. In this case, we've done it by adding depth everywhere. Um, we can add depth selectively at the quarter points as a way of forcing these members to hold their shape. Or in this case, we've made it a fully uh, developed uh, bow truss with web members that hold the compression cord in shape. The tendency to have more load near the supports than at the center of the structure is more pronounced in domes than it is in arches. And the reason is that the dome is pie-shaped in plan, being widest near the base and narrowest at the zenith. So in other words, we have more structural skin to support or more dome to support in this zone where this width is greater than up near the top. Because of the greater accumulation of load near the supports, the funicular shape for the dome tends to be a bit fuller in that part of the structure even than the catenary. The actual mathematics of the funicular shape for the dome is very challenging to generate and is beyond the scope of this video. However, as we shall demonstrate, the funicular shape is somewhere between a sphere and a catenary. We will also demonstrate that the precise funicular shape 
is less critical for domes if they're carefully designed than for arches. So let's see if we can try to understand that. This is a hemispherical small circle dome consisting of this lamella pattern for the first three bands and then a pisector uh, subdivision for the portion of the dome near the top. The horizontal circles serve to hold the dome together under its tendency to bulge outward under both snow load and its self weight. And that is demonstrated in the results of this analysis. These analytic results show compression forces in yellow flags and tension force in cyan flags. From, for the top of the dome, all the members are in compression. Below 53 degrees from the zenith, the horizontal hoops go into tension. The tension hoops are holding the dome in shape so that the primary compression members can do their work in compression without going into severe bending. So all these members coming down the dome to the boundary are the compression members that are supporting the structure against gravity loads. So in this case, we're showing the effect of gravity loads in the members. And what we're discovering is there's a substantial amount of tension in this ring and in that ring, but we're not seeing that effect up above where everything is working in compression. Uh, when we look at the deformed shape, it enhances our understanding of where tension forces are occurring and why they're occurring. So you'll recall in the case of the semicircular arch, the center part tends to collapse downward. It tends to bulge outward at the quarter points. And we're seeing a similar kind of behavior in the case of the dome. It's tending to deform downward and bulge outward at the quarter points. And this outward stretching of the tension hoops is quite apparent here. Um, as the original shape of the hoops is here and the uh, deformed shape is larger in diameter. The presence of these tension hoops makes domes in the shape of a sphere feasible structurally. In other words, these tension hoops compensate for the fact that the sphere is not the ideal shape, but they're working very efficiently in tension, uh, which is our most effective uh, and efficient form of structural action. They're working in tension to hold the compression members in place. So in this case, we've got a series of compression members, all of which want to bulge outward and these tension hoops are what is holding this whole thing together. The stabilizing effect of the tension hoops explains why so many successful domes have been made in the shape of a sphere, even though a sphere is not the ideal or funicular shape. Tension hoops become incredibly important when the dome is more than a hemisphere, since the tendency to bulge near the equator is driven not only by the compression in these members, which is trying or trying to bulge outward, but also the compression in these members, which are trying to bulge outward. And again, here you see tension members going around this dome, which are holding it together and allowing it to work. This is the Climatron at the Missouri Botanical Gardens designed by Thomas C. Howard of Synergetics Incorporated. The tension members in the Climatron dome may be less apparent, but they are still there. So as you trace these tension members all around the structure, it's laced together with dozens of these elements. When we want a tall dome, and we also want to avoid the extreme bulge and the narrow base, which creates a tendency of the structure to simply roll over, we can change from a spherical shape to an elliptical shape with the major axis stretched out in the vertical direction. Um, this is a very nice photograph because the mirror image down here sort of gives us the overall shape of the structure, which is roughly elliptical. 
Um, the Gherkin Building in London, this is 30 uh, St. Mary's Axe in London is another example of this kind of geometric morphing. This is basically a lamella dome that has been stretched out vertically into an elliptical form where every one of these horizontal elements then defines a floor in the building. This is about as far from the funicular shape it is, as it's possible to get. This is uh, the dome at Epcot Center at Disney World in Orlando, Florida. There is no way that this thin shell sphere is the logical structural response to the huge localized forces exerted by the giant pylons that are holding it up. The action of these pylons on this thin shelled sphere would be analogous to a pin puncturing a thin egg shell. Those of you who have ever done this have discovered that you can easily punch a hole in that shell and hardly do any damage to the rest of it because the shell is not designed to withstand that highly localized force and the shell exhibits punch through at that point. Uh, these pylons would be the perfect way to destroy the thin, the thin spherical surface structure. The structure has huge amounts of complex interior truss work. To distribute the localized loads of these pylons over the spherical surface structure. You can think of this as less like a dome and more like a sculpture with a spherical outer skin, similar to the Statue of Liberty where the skin is not a significant part of the structure, but all of the structure is contained internally. That ends our video on the uh, appropriate shape for domes.